。大家好，读你听二点零，今日继续读 Agatha Christie 嘅 Sparkling Cyanide 入到最后直路啦 ，Book Three 嘅 Chapter Twelve。啊，上一回咧就已经将呢个凶手嘅一个人选咧就缩窄到 Sandra 同埋 Ruth 两者之间啊。咁啊，暫且將 Iris 排除在外啦。而 Anthony 咧，亦都好似探完上身咁樣，正係送緊 Iris 咧去同 Scotland Yard 咧就和盤托出啦嚇，就話俾警方聽咧 ，Iris 咧就曾經被栽裝喎，將啲山埃就擺喺佢手袋度。咁呢一節咧就睇下嗰個案情咧，進入最後階段啦嚇，睇下有啲咩謎底揭曉啦。Three men sat at a small round marble top table. Colonel Race and Chief Inspector Kemp were drinking cups of dark brown tea, rich in tannin. Anthony was drinking an English cafe's idea of a nice cup of coffee. It was not Anthony's idea, but he endured it for the sake of being admitted on equal terms to the other two men's conference. Chief Inspector Kemp, having painstakingly verified Anthony's credentials, had consented to recognize him as a colleague. If you ask me, said the Chief Inspector. Dropping several lumps of sugar into his black brew and stirring it, this case will never be brought to trial. You never get the evidence. You think not? Asked Race. Camp shook his head and took an approving sip of his tea. The only hope was to get evidence concerning the actual purchasing or handling of cyanide by one of those five. I've drawn a blank everywhere. It will be one of those cases where you know who did it and can't ever prove it. So you know who did it. Anthony regarded him with interest. Well, I'm pretty certain in my own mind, Lady Alexandra Veraday. So that's your bet," said Race. Reasons? You shall have them. I'd say she's a type that's madly jealous and autocratic too, like that queen in history, Eleanor of something that followed the clue to Fair Rosamond's bower and offered her the choice of a dagger or a cup of poison. Only in this case," said Anthony, "she didn't offer Fair Rosemary any choice." Chief Inspector Kemp went on. Someone tips Mr. Barton off. He becomes suspicious, and I should say his suspicions were pretty definite. He wouldn't have gone so far as actually buying a house in the country unless he wanted to keep an eye on the Faradays. He must have made it pretty plain to her, harping on this party and urging them to come to it. She's not the kind to wait and see. Autocratic again. She finished him off. That you say so far is all theory and based on character. But I'll say that the only person who could have had any chance, whatever, of dropping something into Mr. Barton's glass just before he drank, would be the lady on his right. And nobody saw her do it," said Anthony. "Quite. They might have, but they didn't. Say, if you like, she was pretty adroit. A positive conjurer." Ray's coughed. He took out his pipe and began stuffing the bowl. Just one minor point. Granted, Lady Alexandra is autocratic, jealous, and passionately devoted to her husband. Granted that she did not stick at murder. Do you think she is the type to slip incriminating evidence into a girl's handbag? A perfectly innocent girl, mind, who has never harmed her in any way. Is that in the Kidderminster tradition? Inspector Kemp squirmed uneasily in his seat and peered into his teacup. Women don't play cricket, he said. If that's what you mean. Actually, a lot of them do," said Ray, smiling. "But I'm glad to see you look uncomfortable." Camp escaped from his dilemma by turning to Anthony with an air of gracious patronage. "By the way, Mr. Brown, I want to say that I'm very much obliged to you for the prompt way you brought Miss Mao along this evening to tell that story of hers." "I had to do it promptly," said Anthony. "If I'd waited, I should probably not have brought her along at all." "She didn't want to come, of course," said Colonel Ray. She's got the wind up badly, poor kid," said Anthony. "Quite natural, I think. Very natural," said the inspector and poured himself out another cup of tea. Anthony took a gingerly sip of coffee. "Well," said Camp, "I think we relieved her mind. She went off home quite happily." After the funeral," said Anthony, "I hope she'll get away to the country for a bit. Twenty-four hours peace and quiet away from Auntie Lucilla's non-stop tongue will do her good, I think." Aunt Lucilla's tongue has its uses," said Briggs. "You're welcome to it," said Ken. "Lucky I didn't think it necessary to have a shorthand report made when I took her statement. If I had, the poor fellow would have been in hospital with writer's cramp." "Well," said Anthony, "I dare say you're right, Chief Inspector, in saying that the case will never come to trial. But that's a very unsatisfactory finish. And there's one thing we still don't know: who wrote those letters to George Barton, telling him his wife was murdered?" We haven't the least idea who that person is. 
Ray said, your suspicion is still the same, Brown. Ruth Blessing? Yes, I stick to her as my candidate. You told me that she admitted to you she was in love with George. Rosemary, by all accounts, was pretty poisonous to her. Say she saw suddenly a good chance of getting rid of Rosemary and was fairly convinced that with Rosemary out of the way, she could marry George out of hand. I grant you all that, said Reyes. I would admit that Ruth Lessing has the calm practical efficiency that can contemplate and carry out murder, and that she perhaps lacks that quality of pity which is essentially a product of imagination. Yes, I give you the first murder, but I simply can't see her committing the second one. I simply cannot see her panicking and poisoning the man she loved and wanted to marry. Another point that rules her out, why did she hold her tongue when she saw Iris throw the cyanide packet under the table? Perhaps she didn't see her do it, suggested Anthony, rather doubtfully. I'm fairly sure she did, said Rays. When I was questioning her, I had the impression that she was keeping something back, and Iris Mao herself thought Ruth Blessing saw her. Come now, Colonel, said Kem. Let's have your spot. You've got one, I suppose, Rays nodded. Out with it. Fair's fair. You've listened to ours and Rays objections. Rays' eyes went thoughtfully from Kem's face to Anthony and rested there. Anthony's eyebrows rose. Don't say you still think I am the villain of the piece. Slowly, Ray shook his head. I can imagine no possible reason why you should kill George Barton. I think I know who did kill him, and Rosemary Barton too. Who is it? Ray said musingly. Curious how we have all selected women as suspects. I suspect a woman too. He paused and said quietly, "I think the guilty person is Iris Mar." With a crash, Anthony pushed his chair back. For a moment, his face went dark crimson. Then, with an effort, he regained command of himself. His voice, when he spoke, had a slight tremor, but was deliberately as light and mocking as ever. By all means, let us discuss the possibility. He said, "Why Iris Mal? And if so, why should she, of her own accord, tell me about dropping the cyanide paper under the table?" Because, said Rays, she knew that Ruth Lessing had seen her do it. Anthony considered the reply. His head on one side. Finally, he nodded. Past, he said. Go on. Why did you suspect her in the first place? Motive, said Rays. An enormous fortune had been left to Rosemary, in which Iris was not to participate. For all we know, she may have struggled for years with a sense of unfairness. She was aware that if Rosemary died childless, all that money came to her, and Rosemary was depressed, unhappy, run down after flu, just to move when the verdict of suicide would be accepted without question. That's right. Make the girl out a monster, said Anthony. Not a monster," said Rays. "There is another reason why I suspected her. A far-fetched one. It may seem to you, Victor Drake. Victor Drake." Anthony stared. "Bad blood, you see. I didn't listen to Lucilla Drake for nothing. I know all about the Mao family. Victor Drake, not so much weak as possibly evil. His mother, feeble in intellect and incapable of concentration. Hector Mao, weak, vicious, and drunken. Rosemary, emotionally unstable." A family history of weakness, vice, and instability, predisposing causes. Anthony lit a cigarette. His hands trembled. Don't you believe that there may be a sound blossom on a weak or even a bad stock? Of course there may, but I'm not sure that Iris Mal is a sound blossom. And my word doesn't count," said Anthony slowly, "because I'm in love with her. George showed her those letters, and she got in a funk and killed him. That's how it goes on, is it? Yes, panic would obtain in her case." And how did she get the stuff into George's champagne glass? That I confess I do not know. I'm thankful there's something you don't know. Anthony tilted his chair back and then forward. His eyes were angry and dangerous. You've got a nerve saying all this to me. Rays replied quietly. I know, but I considered it had to be said. Camp watched them both with interest, but he did not speak. He stirred his tea round and round absentmindedly. Very well, Anthony said upright. Things have changed. It's no longer a question of sitting round a table drinking disgusting fluids and airing academic theories. This case has got to be solved. We've got to resolve all the difficulties and get at the truth. That's got to be my job, and I'll do it somehow. I've got a hammer at the things we don't know because when we do know them, the whole thing will be clear. I'll restate the problem. Who knew that Rosemary had been murdered? Who wrote to George telling him so? Why did they write to him? And now the murders themselves. Wash out the first one. It's too long ago, and we don't know exactly what happened. But the second murder took place in front of my eyes. I saw it happen. Therefore, I ought to know how it happened. 
The ideal time to put the cyanide in George's glass was during the cabaret, but it couldn't have been put in then because he drank from his glass immediately afterwards. I saw him drink. After he drank, nobody put anything in his glass. Nobody touched his glass. Nevertheless, next time he drank, it was full of cyanide. He couldn't have been poisoned, but he was. There was cyanide in his glass, but nobody could have put it there. Are we getting on? No, said Chief Inspector Cap. Yes, said Anthony. The thing has now entered into the realm of conjuring trick or a spirit manifestation. I will now outline my psychic theory. Whilst we were dancing, the ghost of Rosemary hovers near George's glass and drops in some cleverly materialized cyanide. Any spirit can make cyanide out of ectoplasm. George comes back and drinks her health. And oh Lord! The other two stared curiously at him. His hands were holding his head. He rocked to and fro in apparent mental agony. He said, "That's it. That's it." The bag. The waiter. The waiter. Camp was alert. Anthony shook his head. No, no. I don't mean what you mean. I did think once that what we needed was a waiter who was not a waiter but a conjurer, a waiter who had been engaged the day before. Instead, we had a waiter who had always been a waiter, and a little waiter who was of the royal line of waiters, a cherubic waiter, a waiter above suspicion, and he is still above suspicion. But he played his part. Oh Lord, yes, he played a star part. He stared at them. Don't you see it? A waiter could have poisoned the champagne, but the waiter didn't. Nobody touched George's glass, but George was poisoned. A indefinite article, the definite article. George's glass, George, two separate things, and the money, lots and lots of money. And who knows? Perhaps love as well. Don't look at me as though I'm mad. Come on, I'll show you. Thrusting his chair back, he sprang to his feet and caught Camp by the arm. Come with me. Camp cast a regretful glance at his half-full cup. Got to pay, he muttered. No, no, we'll be back in a moment. Come on, I must show you outside. Come on, race. Pushing the table aside, he swept them away with him to the vestibule. You see that telephone box there? Yes. And then he felt in his pockets. Damn, I haven't got two pens. Never mind. On second thoughts, I'd rather not do it that way. Come back. They went back into the cafe. Camp first, race following with Anthony's hand on his arm. Camp had a frown on his face as he sat down and picked up his pipe. He blew down it carefully and began to operate on it with a hairpin, which he brought out of his waistcoat pocket. Race was frowning at Anthony with a puzzled face. He leaned back and picked up his cup, draining the remaining fluid in it. Damn, he said violently, it's got sugar in it. He looked across the table and met Anthony's slowly widening smile. Hello, said Camp as he took a sip from his cup. What the hell's this? Coffee, said Anthony. And I don't think you like it. I didn't. This Anthony Brown pulled this little little stunt, put two guys to the floor, brought them to the door, and then came back. They found that the alcohol in the camp had fallen down. So that means that Anthony had already caught the knife. He also caught the knife and took it to the bar. It worked. So what he got back was just. 需要知道呢個兇手嘅動機嘅啫，同埋咧亦都、呃、透露咗啦，即係落呢個毒嘅途徑咧，好可能係要利用咗呢個侍應喎、哦。咁但係點樣利用法呢？嚇、啊，暫時啊冇明講嘅，嚇咁啊唔知道你哋諗唔諗到啦。三個探員啦、啊，喺度互相交換資訊啦、啊，互相有佢哋大家嘅。嫌疑人啦，分別有 Ruth 啦、Sandra 啦，同埋 Iris 啦，嚇三個都有嘅。呢一節咧就有幾個字同大家分享啦。Autocratic 嚇、啊、呢、这個 Autocratic 咧形容 Sandra Verity 嘅講好多次嘅，意思即係 taking no account of other people's wishes or opinions, domineering， 好獨斷獨行啊，啊專制嘅。Cherubic Cherubic 嚇呢度就係講嗰個。形容嗰個侍應啦，嚇嗰啲幫兇啦，佢係唔知情嘅，好無辜嘅嘅情況之下，嚇 having the innocence of plump prettiness of a young child， 好似天使咁樣嘅，只係關心佢嘅工作嗰天使咁樣嘅出心嘅侍應，啊，竟然就變咗幫兇啦，咁啊，有一個對比喺度。Festival, festival， 誒頭先我之前講過嘅門廳嘅意思啦，嚇 ，an outer chamber, hall or lobby next to the outer door of a building。喺啲西式嘅大廈或者餐廳一入個門咧，就唔會直接入個廳嘅，有一個小小嘅門廳嘅，有可能係一啲旋轉門啦，又或者係一啲小門啦。咁通常呢啲位置都會放一個電話喺度。好，我哋下一次再見，拜拜。